Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming in, and uh, welcome to the Resource Governor session. Uh, my name is Amit Bansal, and I will be your host for the next one hour. I work for eDominar Systems and People Wear India. Sometimes we speakers do not like to be put on the last slot of TechEd. Uh, but I want to take this to my advantage because uh, what I'm going to show you, the technical stuff around Resource Governor is awesome, and that would be one of the lasting things on your memory and would remain fresh in your memory because this being the last session. That's, that's reason number one. The second reason I think is all of you who are here just before the party, which means you're really interested in Resource Governor and what I'm going to show you. So a big round of applause for all of you. Thank you. That speaks volume of you, and, uh, and I would really do best to get as much technical info to you so that you can take it back and apply it in your environment. So back in India, I lead a specialized team of uh, SQL Server specialists, and what we do is troubleshoot SQL Server performance. We work with some of the largest customers who run their businesses on SQL Server. And me and my team, we go to customer locations we identify bottlenecks, issues that are causing uh, 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 performance issues. We identify, we diagnose them, we fix them. And our customers love us also because most of the performance issues that we fix were actually created by us when we visited them last time. So jokes apart, the, everyone loves performance. And this session is all about performance. How can you get predictable performance with the help of resource governor. And everyone wants good governance. Even the president wants good governance. And if you look at his expression, he really wants good governance. This guy on the slide looks like me. He is a SQL Server nerd, Microsoft Certified Master on SQL Server, SQL Server MVP, and MCT. A couple of more M's he has to his name, but you know, there was not enough space on his hand, so that's not there. And when it comes to SQL Server, in the last 12 years, this guy has done almost everything. SQL Server projects, consulting, training, content development, SQL Server certifications, proof of concepts, you name it, and this guy has done it. However, if you ask him anything other than SQL Server, he's dumb. He doesn't know anything about anything else other than SQL Server, which is not a good thing, but that's the fact. Uh, this guy's also spoken at a couple of TechEd conferences in the past, including 2007, 2008, 9, um, 11, 12, 13, and this year, uh, 2014. And uh, also the founder of SQLServerGeeks.com. By any chance, have you visited this site ever, SQLServerGeeks.com, on your SEOs? Okay. All right. Thanks. And that's the email ID and the uh, Twitter handle. Now, sometimes I think that uh, one hour is actually not enough for really to learn something. If that would have been the case, universities would have had breakout sessions rather than whole day classes. Uh, but yes, what is important and what I'm trying to do in this next one hour is give you some very, very specific takeaways with respect to resource uh, governor, specifically in SQL Server 2014. Uh, and uh, this is a good time for a quick uh, show of hands, how many of you have worked with Resource Governor before? You have implemented it in your production environment. OK, I see a couple of hands. How many of you have not implemented it in production environment, but you kind of know about it? OK, there's some of you there. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I will do, and I, and I assume that the rest of you are pretty new to Resource Governor. I'll spend uh, just about two minutes on introducing Resource Governor to you. That would be my first slide. My second slide would talk about why should you care about I.O. governance? Uh, resource Governor just does not allow you to govern I.O., but also CPU and memory. But our focus today is only I.O. Then there are certain misconceptions and myths around I.O. governance, because I.O. governance is, is absolutely a new feature in 2014, and we're still working on it. We're still trying to find out uh, what it does and what it doesn't, and this slide will demystify a few things around what exactly can it govern. Then we get into a, a, a bit more syntactical and technical details as to how can you really do it, followed by what are the new extended events and perfmon counters that you should be aware of from the perspective of monitoring and troubleshooting. Then I have a very, very crisp demo and a very interesting demo 
uh, to show you around resource governor, followed by our summary and call to action. So the specific takeaways for you, and we all, have, all of us together have to meet that objective, is know what resource governor is, how does IO governance really work, understand the demo, take whatever you, your takeaways back to your environment, play around with it, test it. If you feel comfortable and if you see that there is a place where you can apply it, uh, that's really where we meet our goals. So the overview of resource governor, um, this is a very common uh, diagram that you will see in books online and in other white papers whenever someone has to really explain res what resource governor is. And I'll switch back to my desktop here to draw a few things. So, oh, I can only see this here. Okay, fine. So what you have at the bottom is certain, okay, I think I cannot see the output here. Not a problem. So what you have at the bottom is a set of pools. If you see, there are four pools out there, the internal pool, pool 1, pool 18, and default pool. When you enable resource governor, which you can do from management studio or from T-SQL code, you can actually create these pools. These pools can have their corresponding workloads. You can create more than one workload group inside a pool. Now, out of these four pools that you see on the diagram, the pool one up to pool 18 are user-defined pools. These pools are configured with specific amount of resources, specific amount of CPU in terms of percentage, specific amount of memory in terms of percentage, and now in 2014, you can specify IOPS input output operations per second. Two pools that you see is on, on, the, on your left hand side you have a pool called internal pool and on the right you have a default pool. These two pools are available to you by default and I'm going to talk about them in a moment. The whole idea of creating pools and workload groups is that you configure them with specific resources depending on how you want to prioritize your workload. After your workload groups, you see there is something called as a classifier function, right? Classification, a, a rhombus out there. And you have, uh, that is a user-defined function. This classifier function is actually created in the master database. Now, let's connect all the dots and how the entire thing works. When you have user requests coming in, they have to pass through the classifier function. This classifier function, which is a user-defined function, has the, has the logic of which workload group should be assigned to the incoming request. Now, for example, you, have, you want to classify the workloads based on username. You want to classify workloads, workloads based on application name. Or you want to classify workloads based on the database name. So when incoming requests are coming in, they pass through the classifier function. It's a simple user-defined function in master database, and you write your logic. The user-defined function returns the name of the workload group. And depending on your logic, your workload gets assigned to a specific pool. Now, depending on which pool it goes to, it gets the configured amount of CPU, memory, and I.O. for that particular uh, workload. If a particular workload does not fall into any of the pools, it goes to the default pool. And that's the purpose of default. E even in the default pool, you can actually configure um, CPU, memory, and I.O. Uh, that's configurable. There are certain SQL Server background processes like Lazy Writer, uh, Resource Monitor, Checkpoints, a couple of them. Those are the processes that you actually cannot govern. They will go to, they will always go to the internal pool. So internal pool is a pool which is not configurable, and you cannot pressurize those internal processes of SQL Server. What is the idea of this entire uh, uh, feature? Uh, if you look on your left-hand side, the goal is to minimize the performance impact, minimize the performance impact created by runaway queries or throwaway queries, and give more predictable performance to your mission-critical workloads. That's the idea. You prioritize your mission-critical workloads, you give more resources to them, and you give less resources to non-mission-critical workloads. Well, when it comes to the technical details of resource governor, there is a lot more, and I'm going to talk about that throughout uh, this session. Just to let you know, uh, in SQL Server 2012, we, there was an incremental change, and you can create up to 64 pools now. So 
if we go and uh, if we look back a little about the history of resource governor, so in SQL Server 2008, this feature was introduced. Uh, this was only available and still is only available in Enterprise Edition. And at that point, SQL, uh, SQL Server 2008 only offered CPU and memory governance. It was, it was really motivated by customer feedback that they wanted this kind of feature, and, and it worked really well for many customers, CPU and memory governance. SQL Server 2008 R2 did not offer any incremental enhancements, and SQL Server 2012 saw good improvements from the perspective of uh, CPU governance. There were a couple of uh, uh, minor increments, uh, in incremental enhancements, like as I said, you can create up to 64 pools, but what really pleased me was you get more finer granular control over CPU resources, CPU governance. And there's a, there's a reason behind it, because uh, there's a rapid improvement in the uh, advancement in the hardware that we had seen at a very fast uh, uh, pace. And today you have sockets available with a lot more cores than that was available like three years or four years back. So it's not really uncommon to get uh, uh, like boxes so easily with 64 cores or 128 cores or even 256 cores. So customers wanted uh, fine-grained control over your CPU resources. And CPU cap percent and effetinization are wonderful uh, incremental enhancements that were done in SQL Server 2012. And SQL Server 2014 really makes it feature complete, in a way, uh, by offering I.O. governance. Two more important slides before we move into the demo. The one is, why do you care about uh, resource governance? So let me ask you this question. Uh, whenever, you, whenever you troubleshoot performance with SQL Server, most of the times, where do you see bottlenecks? Is it CPU? Is it memory? Or is it I.O.? Most of the times. I.O.? Thank God you said I.O. You know, otherwise, I would have been very embarrassed. So that's the general feedback that I get always. And there are, now again, there are rationales behind it. One of the main reasons why I.O. Uh, is always under a lot of pressure is today you have big boxes available. You have a lot of memory available on your boxes. Very easy to get like 256, 512 GB RAM or even one terabyte for that matter. Uh, cost of that kind of hardware is really low. You get, and as I said, we already talked about sockets with more cores on it. So in a well-tuned system, you have a lot of memory available and you have a lot of CPU cycles to spare. But when it comes to I.O., the story is again different. Most customers run their SQL servers off uh, storage area networks. Storage area networks are, are expensive. It's not so easy for customers to upgrade their SANs. And a central storage area network um, actually facilitates storage for many applications, many servers. And it's a shared storage. That's the whole concept. So SQL Server is actually competing for resources. Even if customers are running SQL Server with direct attached storage, Still, high-performing disks are still expensive, and it's not so easy to upgrade even those disks. So I.O. bottlenecks are definitely very common, specifically when our OLTP workloads or even analytical workloads are highly I.O. intensive. So it's no-brainer that uh, I.O. is one of the holy trinities in SQL Server, and it is super critical when it comes to SQL Server performance. Customers also wanted to provide I.O. isolation. That has been one of the biggest pain points for customers uh, who, are, who are, for example, like hosting companies, like hosters. They want to provide IO uh, isolation for their customers and for their workloads, or for, for that matter, uh, customers offering private cloud as a service, or implementing private cloud in their own enterprise, or customers who are offering database as a service. So that has been a very common requirement. And of course, overall, uh, customers running SQL Server want performance predictability. They were able to get it in terms of CPU and memory, but not with I.O. So I.O. was really, really in demand. Now look at the three bullet points that I have under performance predictability. Rogue workloads, throwaway queries, maintenance operations. Now, whenever you read material or you know, hear speakers like us talking about resource governor, we talk in the context of throwaway queries or, or rogue workloads and you really want to give very less resources to them. But it's just not about minimizing performance impact uh, because of those people. Maintenance operations are also important. Now, let's take an example. So uh, there's a customer, and the CIO uh, of that company uh, has kick-started a, a consolidation project. 
And one of the things that customers do as, uh, as part of the consolidation project is bring multiple databases on a single box in a single instance. And now what happens is there, these databases are large. One of the tables in one of the databases is really huge, say 500 GB. And that table is under heavy OLTP activity. And what the customers and the DBAs do is every night they do an index maintenance operation, which is very IO intensive, highly IO intensive, because it's like rebuilding an index for a 500 GB table. It is going to take a couple of hours. Now look at the other database. Now if this company is a 24 by 7 operation, when this IO intensive maintenance operation is going on for the second database, and when the first database needs IOPS from the same storage, this is going to have a huge performance impact because of this workload. So this is not a rogue workload. This is not a throwaway query. This is a pretty much a, an important maintenance operation. But this is going to impact the performance of this workload. And for God's sake, if this is really a mission critical workload and you have to meet some kind of SLAs in terms of performance or availability, um, that's the place where you really want you have headaches. So what you can do with resource governor IO is Configure it in such a way that workload, which is like maintenance operations or index rebuild, get less IOPS because both are IO intensive operation. These folks get less IO and you allocate more IOPS to the, uh, to the other database. This will result in what? This will result in this operation, this mission critical workload getting uh, better performance, more predictable performance, of course, on the cost of the maintenance operation. So if this maintenance operation was taking, about, was taking about four hours, might take five hours or six hours. But you might be okay with it because that's not a 24 by seven operation and you just want to finish it over, over the night. So these are certain case studies or scenarios where uh, IO governance becomes so very critical and we're talking about IO intensive workload. Let's get a little more technical as to what can you really govern with a uh, resource governor in SQL 2014 when it comes to IO. First and foremost, the IO governance uh, engine in SQL 2014 is designed mostly towards uh, governing read IO, right? Read operations, not much towards write operations. And I'm going to justify that in a moment. But when you talk about read IO, it will govern your read IO, but it will only govern physical reads, not logical reads. Now, I'm sure all of you know what's the difference between physical read and Logical read. Physical read is actually reading off the disk, right? And logical read is reading that 8 KB page from memory. So that's definitely not going to be governed because it's not off the disk. And of course, this uh, engine of resource governor would govern your data files, not your log files. So be clear about these things that it's designed towards uh, governing or regulating your read, work, uh, read workload, read IO, physical reads, and, to, uh, and uh, uh, target it towards your data files. Now, when it comes to write, now write will have, have, have two paradigms. The inserts, that's a write operation, and updates. Updates are your read as well as write. So there are certain caveats around it, and I am going to demystify these caveats not on this slide, but in my demo. So we'll just park that for a moment and we'll come back and visit this again. Another important thing about resource governor, governance here is internal pool. Any background operation, internal process of SQL Server which goes to internal pool cannot be governed, right? What can be governed is only uh, when your workloads go to your user-defined uh, pools. Now because uh, resource governor is all about read IO, we can spend some time uh, understanding how the read pattern of, uh, of SQL Server works. And I'm sure many of you would know that mostly the SQL Server uh, read IOs are asynchronous IO, right? That's asynchronous. What do you mean by asynchronous IO pattern? A SQL Server would send, give an IO request to Windows, right, and back off, continue its work. Windows will do the job of reading from the disk, and when it is done, it will inform SQL Server. That's an asynchronous read, read IO pattern. When, uh, and before SQL Server actually gives that request to Windows and backs off, 
uh, it checks whether the page that it wants to read is in memory or not. So SQL Server will actually call a routine called uh, call buffer pool, um, buffer pool get page routine, it will ca call, and that routine is going to check uh, for the hash page in the memory, and if that page is available in the memory, it's going to be latched, and it's going to be returned to the caller. So you see there's actually no access to I.O. till this point in time. But suppose that page is not in memory, then the request goes to Windows and via, and there are series of steps that occur to read that page from the disk. And this is where, this is where resource governor code comes in. And if you've enabled it, and if you've configured it correctly, it comes in and it starts throttling. And this throttling of uh, I.O. is real time. And this is what we are going to see in the demo also. <clears throat> Feel free to ask me any questions you have uh, at any point in time. How can you do it? While uh, those of you who have worked with Resource Governor would be familiar with some of the syntax there, uh, but this is the syntax as to how, how to create a pool. And when you create a pool, you can see you can specify CPU, memory, min and max memory, and the last piece of code in red is where you specify your minimum and maximum IOPS. Now, there, there's a lot to understand here as to what do you mean by minimum IOPS and maximum IOPS? The whole idea here is, in a simplified version, when a request goes to this particular workload, it will only get the IOPS that you specify here in terms of minimum and maximum. The default is, uh, uh, is zero, uh, the minimum value is zero, and the max value for both of these parameters is two th to the power of 31, which is a very high value. Now, how do you play around with these values, min and max, and what should you really set? That's, that's again important to understand. When you talk about, let's say there are two workloads, right? And let's take, let's take back our old example of the index maintenance operation and the read-only workload between the two databases. Now this index maintenance operation was, for example, was taking 100 IOPS per second, and it was hampering the performance of the other workload. What you want to do, you want to make sure that this index maintenance operation does not take more than 50 IOPS. So which value do you think you will set to 50? It would be max. You said that max will be 50, and you configure the classifier in function in such a way that the index operation goes to this particular pool and does not get more than 50 IOPS. Now where do you, you should configure min, for example? Now this mission critical workload, the other mission critical workload, you want to ensure that whenever this mission critical workload runs, it should always get 500 IOPS, right? It should always get 500 IOPS come what may. That's the place where you will configure the minimum value. Now resource governor code is very dynamic and it's real time throttling. The code does not kick in until and unless there is a contention, which means if there is no IO contention, resource governor will sit back and relax. It has nothing to do. It's only when there is contention, resource governor code will kick in, will read these configuration parameters on real-time basis, and al allocate those many IOPS that you have configured under min. Well, this is how it works. It's always a good idea to set min and max and not leave them to default. Some DMVs that we have here is uh, the uh, new uh, columns that you have in DMVs, uh, resource governor resource pools. So you will see new column for IO max, IO read write queue, stall, and violations. Um, the other DMV, resource governor configuration, will have IO stall for read write latency. These are new columns that you should be aware of. There is a new DMV, uh, resource governor, resource pool volumes that's specifically designed to monitor IO uh, violations, completed, issued, and queued. This helps you in monitoring and keeping a tap of what's going on. Similarly, you have extended events. Uh, with new events that you can see out there, file write enqueued and file read enqueued, which will uh, help you to trace the I.O. request down to the page. And we have six new performance counters, three for read and three for write. And performance counters is something that I'm going to show you in the demo. So are we all set for the demo? Any questions before the demo? Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Very good question. So the question is, 
if you set max IO say, to say 50, but nothing else is really going on and there's no IO contention, then that workload, which is actually configured with 50, can it use more? Yes, it can use more. It's only when there is contention will the resource governor code kick in and will start throttling based on the configuration values that you have set. Yes, sir. Right. So how does so the question, if, if I've understood it correctly, how how does it quantify? How do you know what should be min or max or what value should you set? Is that what your question is? Well, demo would answer that question. So give me uh, some time. Let me come back to uh, get to the demo. It will uh, answer that question. Yes, sir. You said that the resource governor kicks in when you see contention. Right. Uh, again, very good question. So the question is, the contention that resource governor sees and it kicks in, is it based on the contention uh, at overall server level or at instance level? It is at instance level. Now, uh, let me also justify what I'm saying by instance level, is if there is an IO issue at server level, of course SQL Server instance is going to be affected, which in turn resource governor would kick in because there is contention at IO. So IO is common, right, to Windows and SQL that way. Uh, so my demo is about real-time IO throttling. So what is the scenario? Let's discuss the scenario quickly, and then I will jump into the demo. So there is a fictitious company called uh, USA Incorporation, and they have a lot of servers uh, across many of their data centers. They have a lot of departments. Each of these servers have their own dedicated uh, databases. And the CIO of this company has decided to uh, kickstart a consolidation project, and what they want is reduce the count, right? Virtualization, consolidation is all about reducing the numbers. Reduce the count. Get these multiple databases onto single boxes. So there are two important departments. Uh, there, so there are many departmental databases here. Two most important departments that this company has is Republicans and the Democrats. No, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is all I know about US politics. I, when I was actually preparing this demo, when I was preparing this slide, I thought, let me go and read a little more about the Democrats and the Republicans. It was very confusing. So I thought, let me just stick to the name and not go deeper into it. So I just left it to their Republicans and, uh, Republicans and the Democrats, two important uh, departments. However, friends, in this demo, we have to give priority to one of them. So one will win over the other. I leave it up to you. Which one do you want to win in the demo? Which one? Yeah. Anyone is okay? The, yeah? Neither. neither. Okay, neither. That, uh, I go with neither. So we have another department which says tech at attendees. <laughs> so we have another very critical, uh, critical department called tech at attendees, and tech at attendees are running a lot of mission critical workload. Now, as part of this uh, consolidation project, we get all the databases onto single boxes. And what we do is we create, as you saw in the diagram, we will create three pools for these three databases for specific workloads. These pools are going to be configured with their respective uh, CPU, memory, and I.O. settings, but I'm not going to touch CPU and memory because my focus here is uh, I.O. Correspondingly, for each of these pools, we are going to create respective workload groups. And then we are going to set up a classifier function, which is going to classify the incoming request to these specific pools and workload groups. And that's how we, uh, we will, with the help of the classifier function, we will actually correlate the databases and their workloads with this respective pools and workload groups. Then we have a bunch of users who are going to fire workloads and queries. And based on the logic that we write in the classifier function, these workloads will get assigned to the respective pools. And you will see real-time throttling happening. And the idea here would be that first I'm going to run the workloads of Republicans, Democrats, and ticket attendees in isolation. I will run one by one in isolation. And we will note down their performance numbers, the execution time. Then I'm going to run all of them at the same time. And you are going to see that they are going to compete for I.O. because all of them are running at the same time. And we will see that 
take an attendee's workload, which was performing at x, the, the execution time was x, after uh, while when they were running all together, you see the performance of uh, take atten attendees workload group going really bad. So the execution time increases. And now what you want to do is, you want to implement real-time throttling so that the performance uh, it, for the take it attendees workload is good and it comes down. But of course, uh, we will have to sacrifice the numbers for the other two departments. This is really what we will see. And let me jump back to the demo. So I have uh, three databases here, as I said. We have the uh, Republicans DB, the Democrats DB, and we have the tech and attendees DB, right? Three databases have come on a single box as part of the consolidation project. They have their uh, uh, large tables, and I have created a stored procedure which will do some IO intensive workload. In order to configure the resource governor the way I showed you on the slide, what we do is, is the code visible at the back? Yeah, or shall I increase the size a little more? Okay, so we use master, and we are creating three uh, pools. Pool, Republicans pool, Democrats pool, and tech attendees pool. You can do it using the GUI from SQL Server Management uh, Studio, the Object Explorer, sorry, or you can use the T-SQL code. Okay, so that already exists. I've already created the pools. So I've created three pools. I have created three workload groups, Republicans group, Democrats group, and the tech attendees group for these specific pools. This is the part of the syntax. Then we create a classifier function, and I want to hide this and scroll down a little. This is the classifier function, and I am filtering the incoming request based on the original DB name. So as I said, there are multiple ways how you can filter. You can filter on or classify on username, login name, application name, um, host name, the, many of them. I'm using original DB name because I want to track down the incoming request as to for which database they are uh, going to. So if it goes to Republicans database, I return the Republicans group, which means my workload group will get into Republicans group. Similarly for Democrats and similarly for the tech and attendees. If they are for any other database, it goes to the default group. That's my classifier function. And then I have to attach this classifier function with resource governor engine, and that's the code for that. So alter resource governor with classifier function, and I specify the name of the function. And then I have to reconfigure resource governor. And last piece of code is this one, where I'm going to set for all my pools, the three pools, Republicans, Democrats, and Jacket attendees, their minimum value and their maximum value. For my first piece of demo here, you see the min and max is set to there, extreme values, minimum is zero, and max is two to the power 31. So I said this, and I will execute this. Okay. Now let's start the Republicans workload group, and I will also open one of my DMVs here to show you some output. So let me arrange all of them. Let me comment this. So here is a performance monitor. And if you look at the objects that I have used here is under my, uh, I, have a, I have this instance, SQL 2014. And the, the object is resource pool stats. And these are the six new counters that I talked about on the slide. Uh, disk read bytes per second, IO throttled, and IO per second. And similarly, the same for the write. And I am going to see these numbers for all the pools, Democrats, Republicans, and TechEd attendees. On another side, I'm going to use a DMV called DMIO pending IO requests. And I'm sure many of you know about this DMV. This is a very popular uh, DMV and most frequently used DMV when we, whenever we have to troubleshoot IO with SQL Server. This simply gives you how many uh, pending requests you have for IO. So when I run this, you will right now see only as the, just, just one, which is the background default process. So let's go and run the Republicans uh, workload, and I run this, and you will see the numbers. Is the counter value visible from the back, 
or let me zoom in a little here. Okay, there you go. And if you see the, look at this read IO per second. This value is staying on the upper limit of 10, right? You will see 10, 11, 12, 13, something like that, right? That's your IOPS. All other counter values are zero, of course, apart from re uh, disk read bytes per second. That's how much bytes it's reading. And if you look at average disk queue length is less than one, because this is the only IO request that's currently going from SQL Server to Windows, and it's reading everything off the page. So my IOPS count was close to about 10, 11, 12, right? That's what you saw. If we observe the total execution time of this workload, it has completed in about 41 seconds. Is that right? 41 seconds. You can, of course, always go to the messages here, and because I turned on statistics time on, you can see it took about 41,000 milliseconds. So that's the total elapsed time it took for this workload to run. And you saw that the average disk queue length was less than one. Well, if we do the same for Democrats, you will get similar number, right? I don't want to run it, just want to say one minute, but it's the same workload that is going to run for Democrats. However, when I run the TechEd attendees workload, let's see the numbers for this. Let's go back here, and now you will see that the workload request is actually going to TechEd attendees pool, and here you will see the same numbers. This is the bytes that we are reading. We are approximately reading 10, 11, 12. All other counter values remains as zero. Another important counter that you will see here is throttled. So if you see read IO throttle per second remains as zero because there is no throttling happening. Why? Because we have set the minimum to zero and max to a very high value. So there is absolutely no throttling in either case. This average disk queue length is still at zero. And if we run our DMV, this will continue to be one. That's it, because there are not too many requests from SQL Server. How much time does this take to complete? This one takes approximately the same number of uh, seconds, which is about 40, 41, right? Now, if we run all three of them together, that's where we want to see all three workloads competing for I.O. And you will see average disk queue length will shot up, will be more than one, maybe three, four. At times, there will be spikes. Right, and you will uh, also see pending I/O requests as an output of this DMV, uh, which will clearly indicate that there is contention at I/O. So I'm running Republican, I'm running Democrats, and I'm running tech at attendees. And if I go to performance counters, that's where all of them are competing. And now look at this; they are right all. Uh, the IOPS that they are requiring, and this is your average disk queue length. I've taken a snapshot, but this is how it runs. And if you zoom in, uh, let me open the magnifier to just show you the numbers here. That's how it is. So look at average disk queue length, which goes to like 11, 12, 10, 22, and your IOPS that each workload is getting is now under 10. At times it's nine, it's, at times it's eight. Now because they are all competing for IO. If we Go back and look at the output of the DMV, IO pending request, you would probably see a greater number now because there are pending IO requests uh, on the IO path. Of course, at this stage, we would expect that none of them are actually going to complete in the time frame of 40 or 41 seconds because uh, there is contention at IO. So if you look at Republicans, uh, it takes about one minute and two seconds to complete. That's the workload of the Republicans. If the Democrats uh, workload, it's about one minute. That's what you get here. And the TechEd attendees workload takes about 54 seconds. So from 41 seconds, it shoots up to 54 seconds. Now that's a, that, is, that is the context. That's where the performance issue is. Uh, for example, a report or an analytical report or an ETL workload or any IO intensive operation for that matter, which was completing in 40 or 41 seconds, now takes about 54 seconds. So that is the performance degradation that you want to fix. You want more predictable performance for this particular workload. Had the other workloads not running, if they were not running, tech and attendees workload would have given good numbers, but that is not the case. This is what we want to fix. So, 
How can we fix this? If we go back to the resource governor code, now I know that for my pool, my, my workload group, Republicans and the Democrats, this particular workload was taking about 10 IOPS, right, or 11 IOPS. Now, this is an engineer demo. Let me be uh, 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 technically be precise. This is an engineer demo. It, your, first of all, your IOPS are, uh, IOPS are not going to be in units and tens. It's going to be much uh, better. But this is to just show you how the concept works. And now what I'm going to do is, based on this incoming request, I'm going to throttle on a real-time basis, and I want to say that uh, the max IOPS that the Republican spool will get is five. I run this, and I'm configuring it, and I do the same for Democrats pool throttling. I set it to five. And I leave the default for ticket attendees, which is zero, and the max is, a, is the largest max value. Now when I run the workloads, and I'm going to run it shortly, you will observe that when all three workloads are running in parallel, simultaneously, the Republicans and the Democrats' workload will not get more than five IOPS uh, on per second basis. At times, you will see like six or so, but that's just an average, right? Uh, because the, the counter values come in every second. So that's an average of, of like, like 1,000 millisecond. So, but it won't go cross beyond five. On the other hand, ticket attendees' workload will be able to take whatever IOP it needs to run its workload. Our, our final objective with this would be to really see that the performance of the ticket attendees' workload improves. Right? So our output was 54 seconds. We wanted to uh, see it coming down a bit. So let's run this, and then we run the Democrats, and then we run the tech identities. And if you look at the number there, oops, sorry. So there you go. Let me zoom. I'm sorry about that. So you can now see that it's not crossing five, right? For the Democrats and the Republicans, the throttling. And look at the throttling there now. Now, throttling is happening at five, at 11. Now this counter value comes in. There's no throttling for ticket attendees pool, but there is throttling for the Democrats and the Republicans. Counter for your IOPS, it does not go beyond four or five. At times there is six and seven as an average, as I said, but generally on an average, it will not go beyond five. So this is being throttled now. This workload is being throttled on real-time basis. Now, observe, Ticket Identities has completed its job, right? It has completed its job, but Democrats and the Republicans, it's still going on. So you will see, because as I said, this is, you're giving more priority to the third workload, and they are definitely going to pressurize the performance of the first two. And that is still running. So let's see what time has taken and this has taken. This has taken 46 seconds to complete. 46 seconds. The original runtime of this workload was 41 seconds. Without resource governance, IO, it was 54. And when you kicked in resource governor code, when you configured it appropriately, the performance uh, goes up and the runtime value comes down to 46. I mean, this is how you can actually tune the workload depending on the IOPS. So you are able to see how much IOPS a particular workload is taking, and you can configure it accordingly. Well, on the other hand, the other two workloads, right, the Republicans and the Democrats, wow, this fellow is still executing. Okay, that completes at 1 minute 57 seconds. That is, that is how it, it hampers, right, the performance of the other workload. But this is all about giving priority. So the workloads that are not given priority, it takes more time. The other one completes in about 1 minute 38 seconds. That's IO governance with, with resource governor in SQL 2014. Yes, sir? Uh, so read IO per second is, or, or the IOs, is it all, all? Uh, Come again, sir? Uh, not so in read IO per second, mm -hmm. the unit of IO, yeah. is it all full units? Yeah, that's just a unit. That's just a number. Okay. You're talking about the IOPS per second? Yeah. Read IOPS per second? Yeah. yeah, so that's just a number. Uh, that number on a given um, a rotational device would be like in hundreds. For, for SSDs, it will go way up, right? But that's just unit. There's no unit of measurement there. It's just number per second. Okay. Can I have another question? 
Yes. Right. Then when you restricted it, it was five, five, and ten. That's only twenty. Right. Why wasn't it like why was it still around in thirty? The reason why it was still not going up to thirty is because if you look at the resource governor code, I set the max IOPS for Republicans and Democrats to five, which means they cannot take more than five IOPS per second. So I throttled it with that code, right? Uh, so so the question is well, this is the here. This is what I have done, right? So I don't. I make sure that they don't take more than five IOPS. So the first one gets five, the second one gets five, and the third one gets 10, 11, 12, whatever it needs, right? Now, for you know, the the whole idea of IO governance is SQL Server. Uh, you know, really, if as a consultant, if I have to implement resource governor and specifically have to implement IO throttling, I have to dive a little more deep into understanding the IO pattern of SQL Server. Now, SQL Server has a synchronous IO pattern as well as uh, asynchronous IO pattern. And most of the time, as I said, it, it implements async IO pattern. For SQL Server, now, if you look at the average disk queue length, that was really when all the three workloads were running, it was like greater than uh, 10, 15, 30, so on and so forth. It really doesn't matter uh, what the average disk queue length is for SQL Server, because the whole idea of async I/O pattern is send the request, give the request to Windows, back off, and complete, continue your other work, right? Which means SQL Server, at a given point in time, can give hundreds of I/O requests to Windows and just continue its work, right? And I don't know, uh, have you ever seen re read ahead scans happening in Statistics I/O? When you look at Statistics I/O output, there's something called as read ahead. Well, that is one of the logic that SQL Server engine, storage engine, implements with asynchronous I.O. pattern, which is give those 100 requests to Windows. Um, SQL Server will get that one page from Windows. It will start processing it while Windows continues to read the other pages and keep sending them back to SQL. So that's like reading in advance. So that's like read ahead. What, what SQL Server is really bothered about is uh, IOPS uh, per second, which is the number of IO requests that go, and of course, average disk read per second. From a, from a read IO perspective, these are the only two uh, important metrics that we should be bothered about. So once we understand a little more about the, uh, the read and the write IO pattern, this, uh, uh, implementing this is, uh, really makes sense. Now, there were, there were two things on the slide that I, I, I told that I will talk about during the demo, which was the inserts and the updates. That's the right I.O. pattern. So let's see how, how uh, resource governor throttles right I.O. Now, I am showing this demo to you, but with a little bit of caution here. Don't try to throttle right I.O., because resource governor is not designed for that. The moment you start throttling right I.O., you're actually affecting transactional throughput, right? So. So there are certain caveats. Let me first uh, explain that to you. So I am going to close these people. They, uh, we don't need them anymore. And I will take write queries. That is the first one. Now let me change the connection of this one to browse server and take tech at attendees. This is a very simple code that runs in a loop and inserts data. I have this checkpoint code here, but I've commented it, because you, you will definitely, uh, uh, you do not fire checkpoints manually, right? They, they are generally, in most cases, fired by the system. When I run this piece of code, and I go back to the resource governor, you would observe that ticket attendee spool currently does not show any throttling. It does not show any number. Right? It does not show any number at all, simply because, by default, right IOs are not throttled with resource governor, or because we have set our minimum and maximum values, minimum and maximum values to the extremes. Right? Tech entities values we had not changed. Minimum is zero, and max is two to the power 31. Right? So you see no throttling happening. Another reason why you see no numbers coming up here is simply because the pages in which it's writing and the buffer structures are still in memory. Until and unless there is a checkpoint being called, these pages are not going to be flushed down from memory to the disk. But now I will make some changes to this. 
and observe. I will now manually call checkpoint. Though it's not a good practice, this is only for the purpose of demo. So two things that you have seen here that you're not going to do in your production environment. One is call checkpoint manually, and the second one is DBCC drop clean buffers. Okay, I did that because I wanted to initiate physical reads, not logical reads for the purpose of my demo. Now when I run this piece of code with checkpoint, which means after every insert, I am manually telling, I'm telling SQL Server explicitly, please go and flush this page from the memory down to the disk. So write IO or disk IO will happen. And when I run this, and if I start my, and there you go. And if you look at the numbers now, now the workload goes to the pool and you can actually see IOPS with this write operation that is going on. So you can see uh, a number which is close to like 300, 400 IOPS uh, that's going on. There are spikes, but 300 is the average that you will see. But you are not seeing any throttling. Disk write IO throttle per second, which is the sec this counter still remains at zero, which means there is no throttling. Then how does it throttle write IO? Well, this is how it will throttle write IO. If we go back to our code and we say Michigan, mission critical pool throttling, and we say, we know that the number was 300, 400, right? We set it to 100. I want to show you this from a conceptual point of view that resource governor does throttle write IO. It is something that you shouldn't try to do it in your production environment. At least I would back off uh, throttling write operations because it will affect transactional throughput. And of course, that you're not going to call checkpoint manually. So please take this only from a conceptual point of view as to how resource governor code and how the resource governor engine works. If I said that, say that ticket attendees pool should not use more than 100 IOPS, and I configure it that way. And now when I run this particular piece of code, you will observe that now it starts throttling. Oh, I'm so sorry again. Now it will start throttling. So you will see my IOPS will not go beyond 100, but the second last counter, you see, throttling has kicked in, right? Now this throttling here means it's restricting, correct? So about 97 IOPS, 84 IOPS, 76 IOPS, 77 IOPS, it's, it's restricting, 80 IOPS, 78 IOPS, it's restricting that much, it's not letting that happen. So of course transactional throughput is going to get affected. The reason why I bring this up about write IO throttling is only to demystify a few things because when you read white papers and books online articles, et cetera, it would say that SQL Server throttles only read IO, which, uh, which, is, which is okay because that's what you're really going to do. I won't go into the technical details of inaccuracy or accuracy, but the point is it does throttle the write IO uh, here. Yes. Yeah, a good question. It only kicks in when there is contention, but uh, that code gets implemented only if we have configured the minimum value, not the max. Max is actually restricting it ir irrespective of whether there is contention or there is not contention. This is linked to the, the other gentleman's question about that. So it's only to do with the max. You know, that's why in order for me to really show you throttling, and when I was actually working on this demo, I was, I, was, I was actually using RML utilities to throttle with like 200 connections, users in each workload, and my like VM died off, and I decided that's not a good idea. In order for me to show predictable performance with resource governor, my demos have to be predictable in first place. So I didn't want to take chance. That's why I just run it off one thread each. Now the last one is the, the updates. So let me close this off and open my update query. And I will change the connection uh, here for browse server and take ticket attendees. Simple update query, which actually would do a mass update and get all the pages, all the records from the table. And, and just change the value. You are going to see a very different behavior with updates now, because update is a combination of read and write. Here, we, let me first go back to the resource governor code and set the 
min and max for all the pools to default, which is like uh, default in our context, which is zero and the max value. So when I run this piece of code and I go back to with, with the zero and uh, the deep minimum as zero and the max as uh, whatever that high value is, you still see throttling happening. Do you see the, do you see the behavior here? I haven't set any min or max now for ticket attendees pool, but you still see some bit of throttling happening for the update workload. Now this is by default how update workload behaves when resource governor is actually configured. So resource governor uh, code here actually kicks in uh, and even throttles um, on the update. I guess the workload is complete. This happens because one of the best practices is not implemented here. That is whenever you create pools, you should make sure that min and max value is appropriately set. So this uh, code gets completed in about 30 seconds. And what I can do is for my The decked mission. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we had actually set it back. So now when I don't set it to default and I say it to like 2000, because that is the max it's going to get, I set some value. Uh, and when I run this, let me see if this is the correct one that I'm doing. But, anyways, and I go back and look at the perform counter. There you go. And you will now not really see the, uh, any throttling happening. Just you occasionally see zero and one, but that's how it would be. The, uh, so let me be a little uh, uh, candid with you here is the uh, update works a little differently. You know, when it comes to SQL Server code paths, it works a little differently. And this is one piece of the behavior of how resource governor works with the update workload is something that I'm still investigating. Investigating. I was in Redmond last week and I talked with the program managers as to uh, why we see a slightly different behavior with update. If we set the defaults to defaults, which is zero and the max value, you still see some kind of throttling happening. Um, well, the justification for the insert why it throttles with checkpoint is because Originally, when the checkpoint was not there, there was no throttling happening because checkpoint runs in internal pool by default, right? It goes to the internal pool. And internal pool, resource governor doesn't throttle anything that is running in internal pool. But the moment we issue a user-initiated checkpoint in our code, then it runs in our pool, right? In the context of the user. So it starts throttling the right IO. Update is slightly a different story, which I'm still working on, but just wanted to show this to you that that's how the default behavior of update is. Uh, Given uh, the, uh, the, uh, the background of, of this feature and where it should really practic practically be implemented is, and that's the message that I'm trying to send across to all of you, is mostly, mostly for the intensive read workload. That's where you, you should use resource governor to throttle IO and get more predictable performance from resource governor perspective. And it works, uh, so let me come back to my presentation. And this is, uh, as you know, this is an enterprise edition feature, and it's a, it's a wonderful feature. If CPU, memory, and I.O. all combined together can really give you that kind of predictable performance that you are looking for. We have implemented this feature with customers. We have got awesome results. Specifically, there are many customers who are moving to consolidation, to virtualization, and now we can really call it, in a way, feature complete. Of course, there are corners that are always needs to be smoothened, but you can still call it as a feature complete. Um, my summary and my call to action would be, uh, which I always like to give to my audience is, download the scripts. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, just send me uh, a ping. Uh, and of course, I will uh, take it. You can download all the scripts and, uh, and the video and the, and the PowerPoint from the Channel Line website. Uh, download the scripts. Whatever I have done, play around with it in your own environment. You just really don't need anything. I have all the scripts which I will put up. Uh, test it, play around with it. And please explore a little more on Resource Governor IO. White papers will sh soon come out from the product team. There's still no white paper, but it's going to come out soon. And um, when you explore, read more, again, test and try, and finally you go and implement it. That would be the real 
uh, objective. Well, with this, uh, I thank you very much for coming to my session. Really appreciate you were a nice audience, just three or four questions, right? Uh, if you want to tweet, that's, that's a sample tweet out there. Uh, my Twitter handle is A underscore Bunsel. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, any more questions, and I'm there to answer it. Yes, ma'am. This one and? Uh, Ma'am, can I finish off the session? I'll speak to you in person. Can I speak to you in person? Is that OK? Yeah. OK, I'll take that offline. Uh, friends, uh, please uh, fill in the feedback forms. Very important. OK, if you, uh, based on your feedback, uh, uh, I will be able to uh, improve the demos, and that will really say whether you want me next time or not. OK? <laughs> So please fill in the feedback form. There are these resources that I'm sure all of you are already aware of. That's it. And thank you again. Enjoy your ticket party. And, and have a safe trip back home. Thank you, friends. Bye.